So I'm going to talk about machine preservation of the liver in between the donor and the recipient. And uh, I have a couple of disclosures. I'm a clinical investigator in a number of trials and registries involving machine preservation of the liver. So I don't have any financial relationship with companies, but I am involved in clinical trials with these devices. And there are some images and videos from surgery within this talk. So they, um, if you do not want to see images uh, of the liver and images during surgery, then you probably don't want to watch. There are not going to be a lot, but a few. So today, we're going to briefly start with a few definitions, because this topic is a little bit complex and requires um, a little bit of background knowledge with some definitions and understanding some acronyms that will come up over and over again. And then we're going to talk a little bit about expected outcomes after liver transplant and complications that we commonly see after transplant and the complications that we've been seeing reliably for the last 30 years. And then a brief lesson about the liver and how the liver functions in a way that we can understand it so that we can understand how machine preservation of the liver can improve complications after liver transplant. And then we'll talk about a few of the devices that people are currently using, um, especially the ones that we're using here in the United States. And there's far too much data to talk about all of the, all of the trials and all of the devices, but we'll talk about the ones that are used most commonly. And then we'll end with a little bit about selection criteria for machine preservation. So when should we be using machine preservation? When is it safe? When is it not safe? And do we have any concept of that yet? First, a few definitions that will come up over and over again in this talk. So there's two different types of deceased donors. There's donors with brain death. So these are patients who have an illness or an injury that's severe enough to really kill the brain. And they can be diagnosed with a, a brain death with some very strict criteria. And really, then they could be issued a death certificate. And then that's how they can donate their organs. Um, the other type of deceased donor is a donation after cardiovascular death donor. And these are patients with an illness or injury that's very severe, but they don't quite meet the definition of brain death, but their family decides that they're um, um, going to withdraw support and they're going to donate their organs. And as part of that withdrawal of support, there is a period of time that is stressful on the organs because of the way with support is withdrawn, that they're without oxygen for a short period of time. So those DCD organs do have more stress on them. And as a result, there is a slightly higher complication rate. And we'll talk about that. So donation after brain death is DBD and donation after cardiac or cardiovascular death is DCD. And then the types of preservation are static cold storage, which is basically the way we've been storing organs for the last 30 years. Um, they get flushed with a cold preservative and then put in a glorified ice box and transported to the recipient hospital. But the following three are the improvements that we're going to talk about today. So normal thermic machine perfusion, or NMP, is basically putting the, the organ on a device that pumps it with warm oxygenated blood. Hypothermic oxygenated perfusion is... Um, at a cold temperature, but again, filling it with oxygen. And normal thermic regional perfusion is a process that happens at the donor hospital where the organs are perfused uh, with warm oxygenated blood while they're still in the donor. So those are the um, advancements we're going to be talking about today over cold storage, which is the standard static cold storage. And then the complications we're going to be talking about after transplant, which uh, preservation with machine preservation can reduce, is acute kidney injury, or AKI, which is dysfunction of the kidneys, usually temporary, which happens after any big uh, insult or operation, but happens after liver transplant relatively commonly. Early allograft dysfunction, which is um, where the liver takes a little while to wake up, which has big physiologic effects on the body, and ischemic cholangiopathy. Uh, which is narrowings of the bile ducts after liver transplant, and primary non-function, which is where the liver just never wakes up and just never does the 10,000 things that the liver needs to do, and you need another transplant. So those are the major complications after transplant, and I'll put these acronyms down here for most of my slides so that you can refer back to them if, if you um, get confused with all the acronyms. It's kind of an acronym soup. So liver disease is tough on patients for sure. And as your liver disease worsens, your MELD score goes up. And as your MELD score goes up to a maximum of about 40, then your risk of dying within three months is very, very high. So you can see that only 
uh, about 20% of patients are expected to be alive at three months with a meld of about 36. So the risk of dying at three months is extremely high with a high meld. And then we have liver transplant. And here's the survival after a liver transplant, which is kind of extraordinary. You turn that, um, that three-month survival into 15 year survival here at about 15 years about half of patients are still alive after liver transplant so in the top before transplant we're talking about living a few months and after transplant we're talking about living for 15 years so liver transplant is one of the best treatments that medicine has to offer we know that people are waiting for organs all over the world and especially here in california where we have long waiting lists you know there's 2,500 patients waiting for a liver transplant here in california alone so the waiting times are long, and we have heard throughout the whole series of lectures about how there are not enough organs for all the patients in need. And as the world changes and more and more people have diabetes and high blood pressure uh, and obesity, the number of ideal liver donors goes down because those medical problems result in liver problems. And those medical problems mean that the liver is not as good for deceased, deceased donation. So the number of ideal donors or donors without diabetes and hypertension and brain dead donors is not really increasing, but the number of non-ideal donors is increasing. And we know that when we use ideal donors, we have very low complication rates, as you can see here. But when we use non-ideal donors or when we start to push the limits, we get higher rates of complications. And um, sometimes very high rates, and this is hard on the recipient and also dissuades people from using livers uh, from marginal donors. So this is a donor offer we got um, a couple of years ago. This was, uh, you know, kind of an average donor offer from about three hours away. This was a 68-year-old brain-dead donor. You can tell on the CT scan that that the liver has some fat in it. And you can tell on this picture after the liver comes out of the donor that the liver has some fat in it. The biopsy shows that it's a, a, a usable amount of fat, but you know this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for the recipient and it's going to result in some short-term complications. But we move forward with the transplant and they had an uneventful liver transplant until reperfusion. But once we incorporated that liver into the circulation in the recipient, then the recipient started to bleed. And that's a result of the fat in the liver, uh, stopping the liver from being able to help the blood clot. So this patient had what's called EAD or early allograft dysfunction, where the liver is a little bit slow to wake up because it did have some steatosis or some fat in the liver. And this results in problems with the kidneys and there's bleeding requiring blood transfusions. And the patient had to go back to the operating room and had a prolonged stay in the intensive care unit. So this was... Um, the reason that people are reluctant to use marginal livers. And this uh, simulation published a couple of years ago shows that with the increasing rates of obesity and diabetes, more and more livers are gonna be so marginal that they can't be used. And the actual number of liver transplants that we'll be able to do will be decreasing. So if we continue with our current strategies without making any major changes, We'll use about half as many livers as we did in 2010 because the donor quality is worsening as we, we have more chronic diseases in our donors. So here's the solution. What we have to do is change the paradigm. So there are a number of devices that we can use instead of putting the liver on cold storage and transporting in an ice box, we can actually put the liver on a device. So these are two normothermic devices, uh, the Organox device and the Transmedics device. They both travel to the donor hospital. You put the liver on this device when it comes out of the donor, and then you perfuse the liver with warm oxygenated blood. And the liver basically is at a normal body temperature. It has oxygen, it has um, some antibiotics and all the things that the liver needs to be happy. And you basically use this device to, to uh, trick the liver into thinking that it's in the body. So that's normothermic machine perfusion. And then you transport this uh, device with the liver on it back to the recipient hospital and you have lots of time to do your recipient operation. There's also something called normothermic regional perfusion, which is that situation where we're basically 
putting the donor on a heart and lung machine while the organs are still in the donor. So this is all going on at the donor hospital. And it's basically putting the donor on ECMO after support is withdrawn and the heart and lungs stop. And that perfuses all the organs with warm oxygenated blood at a good blood pressure and keeps the organs happy while the uh, donor surgeon procures the organs. And that basically transitions a DCD donor, those higher risk donors, into a brain dead donor. So improving the risk profile of that liver. And then there's hypothermic oxygenated machine perfusion. So this is a device which is very simple. It stays at the recipient hospital and the liver is procured from the donor in the normal way, uh, transported in an ice box as it normally would be in static cold storage. And then when it gets to the recipient hospital, it's put on this device. And it's a very simple device that pumps it with a cold solution that is uh, that has oxygen in it. So that's called hypothermic oxygenated perfusion or HOPE. So these are the major categories, three major categories, NMP, NRP, and HOPE. And there are other devices and other strategies. Uh, certainly, there's a lot going on in the literature right now, which is exciting to see, but we don't have time to cover all of it. And there are devices which are not uh, on this slide, which are very important, but we only have time to talk about these general categories, which are these, these devices are used in the United States. So to talk about liver dysfunction, we have to talk about some general liver function. So I think of the liver as having two functions. Number one, the liver is a filter for all the blood coming from the intestines. So the liver is formed of these plates of hepatocytes, which filter all the blood from the intestines. So it's like an air filter, but it just performs a lot of metabolic processes. And when the liver is not working or you have cirrhosis, those plates of hepatocytes are not working or that filter is not working and you get liver dysfunction. So that's one major um, function of the liver. And the other major function of the liver is to get the bile out. So the liver is created of this beautiful network of, of bile duct tubes made up of cholangiocytes. And those cholangiocytes make little pipes. And then in disease states, those pipes get clogged. So I kind of want you to start thinking of the liver as having two major processes. Problems with the plates of hepatocytes, and that would be something like EAD or early allograft dysfunction, those plates of hepatocytes not working, or problems with the cells that make up the plumbing or the cholangiocytes, and that would be ischemic cholangiopathy. So I think if we take a step back and we think about the liver with these two basic processes, it can really help understand how machine preservation can help us. So these plates of hepatocytes, you can see the schematic on the left is a beautiful picture of, of um, a section of liver and it's made up of these plates of hepatocytes and those hepatocyte, um, those cells that make up those plates, they control our acid balance base in the body, they help the blood clot, they regulate the blood pressure, they help balance our electrolytes, they are really important in metabolism and glucose and they help us stay awake. And the bile duct cells make up those pipes and they excrete bile or they get the bile out of the body and they help a little bit with cholesterol and fat. So when the plates of hepatocytes are not working or that filter function is not working, the patient has, um, they become acidotic or their blood becomes acidotic. They have trouble with bleeding. The kidneys don't work. They can have multi-system organ failure, so it affects the other organs aside from the liver. And sometimes it's so bad that the liver doesn't work at all, and you have what's called primary non-function. Uh, oftentimes, patients need operations for bleeding, and they have prolonged recoveries if they have early allograft dysfunction. And if the bile duct compartment is not working, you get narrowings in the bile duct here. So this is a, a little picture uh, of the, the bile ducts in the liver, and you can see norm, segments of normal bile duct and then segments where there's lots of narrowings in between the normal bile duct, where you can't even see the bile duct there. Those are these uh, clogged pipes, and then the bile backs up in those areas and gets stagnant and gets infection and gets infected. So that's called ischemic cholangiopathy. So we have EAD in the top, which is dysfunction of the plates of hepatocytes and ischemic cholangiopathy here in the bottom, which is dysfunction of the cholangiocytes and the tubes that take the bile away from the liver. 
So let's think about the challenges going on within that liver during static cold storage. So this is a liver being brought in, you know, to our operating room by one of our nurses. This is the kind of a standard liver in a, in a box of ice. And this is how we've been doing transplant for 30 years now. So at, at the donor hospital, uh, the operation starts and then we put a cross clamp on the liver and basically stop the oxygen flowing to the liver at the donor hospital and then it's transported to the recipient hospital in an ice box and it's basically a race against time as the cellular energy stores in those hepatocytes and the cholangiocytes is being used up because it's it's sitting in this box and holding its breath basically and then we do a transplant and we uh, reperfuse the liver with oxygen and blood, and then it restores the energy state. But at some point, if we don't uh, do this quickly enough, we could pass this point of no return where the cells are so low on energy that they can't recover after it's put in the recipient. So that's for a brain dead donor. And this is kind of a schematic of what that same process in a DCD donor. So the donation after cardiac death donor, you can see that that decline is steeper. So they use the cellular energy stores up more quickly. And we get closer to that point of no return where the liver may not wake up after transplant. So here's those two schematics that I just showed you. And now let's insert machine preservation into the mix. So if this is a brain dead donor, uh, after a cross clamp here, if we were to start normothermic preservation here, then it brings the oxygen state or the energy state of all the cells back up to the baseline. So the dip is much, much smaller and you go back up to the baseline and then the liver is transported to the recipient during this period here. And then there's another dip um, for a little while as you're doing the transplant, but as soon as you get the, the vessels hooked up again, it gets back to its baseline. So you can see in this state, we're very far away from um, that point of no return. And for a DCD donor, again, the decline was steeper, but if we get the liver on a normothermic perfusion device, we can get it back up to baseline here for transportation, whereas we get much closer to the point of no return if we don't have it on machine perfusion. So this is the benefit of machine perfusion, really restoring the oxygen state and the energy state of the cells before we put it in the recipient. But what if we don't think about it as just all success or failure, um, but a gradation of failure? So if we were to dip down into this EAD range, uh, as you can see here, then the liver is going to have a slow time waking up, and this is going to be stressful on the recipient. But you can see that uh, with machine preservation, we're able to stay well above the EAD range and certainly above the primary non-function and ischemic glangiopathy uh, point of no return. And even with a DCD donor, we definitely dip lower towards that point, that uh, EAD or early allograft dysfunction, but we get nowhere near the primary non-function. So this is the benefit of machine preservation at reducing both EAD, which is the plates of hepatocytes not waking up and functioning well, and primary non-function, which is the liver not waking up at all, or ischemic glangiopathy, which is those bile duct cells uh, getting clogged. So the way I think of machine preservation in general is related to donor risk. So we know that fatty donors or donors with steatosis, we would say, or DCD donors have a higher risk of EAD. And to reduce that risk, we know that normothermic preservation reduces that risk. And DCD donors also have a higher risk of ischemic glangiopathy or clogging up of the bile ducts with narrowings. And we know that hypothermic preservation is the best at reducing that risk. Now, this is a very 30,000 foot view of some very complex processes. And there's certainly overlapping benefits between normothermic preservation and hypothermic preservation. Uh, so this is uh, not 100% true, but this is a, a very good way to think about this in a general sense to understand the benefits of normothermic preservation on the plates of hepatocytes and hypothermic preservation on the cholangiocytes to reduce the risk of ischemic cholangiopathy. So let's think about the stresses on the liver in the era of cold storage. We start the donor operation and then we cross clamp the liver, so now it's starved of oxygen and it's being transported in, in an ice box and going towards that point of no return where the cells have no energy so they can't uh, wake up after transplant. 
And then we do the liver transplant, put the liver in the recipient, open up the blood vessels, and what happens? So this is a monitor from the operating room. And every time we incorporate a liver into the recipient circulation during a liver transplant, we get what's called peak T waves from the high potassium that comes out of the intestinal blood. We get the slowing of the heart rate, sometimes very, very slow, and we get low blood pressure. So you get what's called um, hypotension. And the anesthesiologists therefore have to give a lot of medications right at the time we reperfuse the liver to increase the blood pressure. And all the medications that they have to give to get the blood pressure up are stressful on the kidneys and the rest of the body, and that results in complications. So this reperfusion event is a very challenging moment for the body uh, right when the liver is reincorporated into the circulation and the medications that we have to give and the stress from this event is one of the reasons that we have complications after liver transplant. And this can be mitigated by machine perfusion. So here's uh, an image of a a nice, beautiful liver that's about to be uh, reperfused. You can see one of my colleagues, Dr. Fang here, is about to take this clamp off the off the vena cava and allow the blood from the liver to, back towards the heart. And this is the event of reperfusion, which is stressful on the body and, and requires a lot of medications to support the patient's blood pressure. So people realize this reperfusion event is stressful for the body. So why does it have to happen in the body? Why can't this happen on a device? So that's the beauty of, of machine preservation is this stressful event where the liver is reincorporated into the body can actually happen on a device. You can fill it with warm oxygenated blood to get the reperfusion event in the bowl and the toxic things that come out of the liver uh, go into the perfusate rather than into the recipient. So it makes a lot of sense that normothermic perfusion uh, reduces the stress on the body because the reperfusion event happens in the bowl before it gets to the patient. And I was lucky enough to go to Birmingham for about a year and train with some amazing liver transplant surgeons at one of the biggest uh, liver transplant programs in the world. Um, the biggest ICU in the world, a massive hospital with some great liver transplant surgeons. And you'll see these names over here over and over again in the uh, publications that talk about machine preservation because they were involved in, in all the early work uh, with normothermic machine perfusion. So normothermic machine perfusion is putting the liver on this device, perfusing it with warm oxygenated cells, uh, with warm oxygenated blood. So this is the device being prepared and then the liver comes out of the donor and has to be prepared at the donor hospital. So that's going on there. And then we put the cannulas into the blood vessels and start the perfusion. So while the liver is here on the device, it's not in static cold storage, so it's not undergoing stress and the liver cells are not holding their breath. It's at body temperature and it thinks it's in the body. It has oxygen and all the other things it needs and it's actually making bile. And if you were to test um, the blood on the circuit here, you would see that the liver is able to, to get rid of the lactate, which is in the perfusate. And that's something that tells you that the liver is doing what it needs to be doing and the liver is working if it can reduce the lactate in the perfusate. But there are some challenges. You have to take this big device and all the equipment to the donor hospital. So this has to travel to the donor hospital and you have to prolong the, the period that you're at the donor hospital because you have to prepare the liver and get it on the perfusion so it takes longer. And it requires a skilled surgeon to be present at the donor hospital, more skilled than normal, because you have to be confident to do any arterial reconstructions that are required before you put the cannulas in. And you have to monitor the perfusion until the liver is transplanted in the recipient. So there has to be someone monitoring the perfusion and dealing with any issues that come up. So it is pretty resource intensive, but it really increases the uh, surge in confidence in the liver and it reduces the complication rates. And this uh, was um, the first major trial published about machine perfusion. And it was um, about half of the patients from this trial were from Birmingham. So while well, at the time when I was there, this is us going to get a liver, putting it on the Organox device and enrolling it in this trial. You can see this is the OR staff and um, the primary investigator and, and 
the highest enrolling surgeon in the trial. They had two livers in the back room, both on the Organox device waiting for transplant. This was 335 patients, and in Birmingham, they enrolled about half of the patients. So it was a massive effort. And this was the first trial showing that um, machine pr preservation was really safe and effective. So reperfusion syndrome was much, much lower in the machine perfusion arm, and early allograft dysfunction much, much lower in the machine perfusion arm. And this initial trial had some marginal donors in it, but was largely standard donors. So not expected to have high complication rates, but you could see the effect of machine preservation for the first time in this first large trial. So this was groundbreaking and opened the door to a lot. And it opened the door to this concept of what's called viability testing. So we put the liver on the device and we see if it clears the lactate and um, if it does, then we think the liver will work in the recipient, and that's called viability testing. So here's a schematic. Um, you withdraw support in the donor, procure the liver, put it on the machine preservation, and then if you see the oxygen state improve and the liver start to work, then you can say this passes um, viability testing and this liver is viable, and then we'll take it for transplant. Here's an example of a liver that say would not pass viability testing. You would withdraw support. You would start machine preservation, but it kind of got into that um, area where the plates of hepatocytes were not waking up quickly enough and it never woke up. So it was unable to reduce lactate. So this liver did not pass viability testing because those plates of hepatocytes failed and then you wouldn't transplant this liver. So this is effective for marginal donors, donors with um, a lot of risk factors. We can put the liver on the device and see if it works. Uh, that's called viability testing. So then the people in Birmingham, you'll notice a lot of those same names here, um, took for the first time a liver that was discarded by all the seven transplant centers in the United Kingdom and put it on a normothermic device and transplanted it. And here you can see, here is the patient doing very well after transplant at Queen Elizabeth Hospital here in the lobby. And this is the data they generated during the viability testing. Most important piece would be here, and I know the numbers are too small to see, but what it is is the lactate. And the lactate starts high. You put the liver on the device, check the lactate in the perfusate, and it starts to drop because the liver is able to metabolize the lactate and clear it out of the perfusate circulation. So that shows you that the liver is working, and this is enough to say, yes, we should use that liver and transplant it. So this was the first example in a human being back um, almost about 10 years ago now, eight to 10 years ago. Um, and this patient is, uh, had a very short recovery and did very well, even though the liver had been declined by all the centers in the United Kingdom prior to transplant. So a groundbreaking paper by the people in Birmingham. And then they went on to do the same thing basically with uh, a number of other donors. And you can see the lactates here. They were able to transplant um, uh, almost all of these organs. One of them you can see here was not reducing the lactate well enough. So they did not transplant that liver, but they were able to take all these livers, which had been uh, turned down by all the UK centers, except that one and transplant it and had very good results. Again, you'll see the same names of authors up in the top. So viability testing is a big step forward and that's, they showed us some successes there. So then that same group went on to do a very important trial where they took some extremely marginal livers and saw how many they were able to transplant. And they saw that uh, they took 31 discarded livers in the United Kingdom. They put them on normothermic device and they were able to clear lactate in 71% of them. So they transplanted 71% of those organs. And they had very good initial outcomes, but they did have a little bit higher risk of early graft loss after 90 days. So some patients um, did require retransplant more than you would expect. But again, these were organs that were discarded by the entire country prior to being put on normothermic preservation. So they were able to transplant 71% of the organs, which is which is astonishing. And then um, but it does show you that we don't quite understand the boundaries of viability testing because the graft survival was not perfect after 90 days. So this just shows that we don't know the boundaries of viability testing yet. So we have a lot more to learn. And you can imagine that this would be a really hard thing to study because you're trying to design a study that is 
at the same time safe, but also tells you what you need to know, which is kind of like designing a study uh, to almost crash an airplane, but then never crash it. And it's extremely hard to design a safe study to do that. So this study was really um, amazing that they were able to do this and show us the power of machine perfusion to reduce organ discard. But we do need uh, more information before we can be confident in viability testing of marginal organs. So what about hypothermic machine perfusion? Let's shift gears. So this is perfusion of the liver with oxygenated solution, but at a cold temperature. And this has been uh, developed in parallel. And there's a, a lot of articles coming out about hypothermic oxygenated perfusion. And as we said, it does a really good job at reducing the injury in the bile ducts. So here's the hypothermic perfusion arm against the standard static cold storage arm. And you can see less biliary complications after hypothermic perfusion. And this has been shown, this is an early trial from 2017, but this has been shown over and over again across the world. And then you can see that graft survival is also better with uh, hypothermic oxygenated perfusion compared to static cold storage. So the uh, graft survival is here in pink and static cold storage, uh, sorry, graft survival for hypothermic perfusion is here in pink and graft survival for um, static cold storage is here in blue and patient survival is similarly better after um, hypothermic machine perfusion of marginal organs compared to static cold storage. So you can see that some patients required retransplant and um, some patients uh, in the static and more patients in the static cold storage arm did not survive, unfortunately. So this shows us that hypothermic oxygenated perfusion has a lot of benefit, both for the bile ducts and for patient and graft survival. And the thinking is that it recharges the mitochondria, both in the hepatocytes, but primarily recharges the mitochondria in the bile duct cells. And it helps the bile duct cells secrete this uh, bicarbonate solution that protects the bile duct cells during times of stress, and they call it a bicarbonate umbrella. So that's what we think the benefits of hypothermic oxygenated perfusion are. So the most widely used device currently for hypothermic um, oxygenated perfusion is this VitaSmart device, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner. And uh, it's been introduced as um, for routine clinical use in a number of countries and 36 transplant centers are currently using it in Europe. It's also expanding to South America and Asia, but it's still not approved for routine clinical use in the United States, which is very important. We're doing a large clinical trial at UCSF using this device, but it's not approved for routine clinical use. That means the patient has to consent to be in the trial and they have to meet the strict inclusion and exclusion criteria to be in the trial to get access to hypothermic oxygenated perfusion. And so far in the last two years um, with this device, they've perfused about 400 uh, livers, uh, all of which have been transplanted into the recipient. There were some issues with the perfusion in four events, um, but if there is a problem with the perfusion, say the power goes out, the liver is still sitting in cold storage because it's it's at a cold temperature, so you're just back to cold storage. So even if there is a big problem with the power or something, then, or one of the cannulas falls out, then the perfusion stops, but it's the liver is still transplantable, which is a very important point. So this is not a completely new technology. This is being used across the world, and we're getting there in the United States, but it's still not approved for routine clinical use. And there's just more and more data um, showing how effective hypothermic oxygenated perfusion is and how it reduces the risk of complications in the recipient, especially for DCD donors. Remember, DCD donors are the ones that have the highest risk of problems with the bile duct after transplant or ischemic cholangiopathy. So hypothermic oxygenated perfusion is really good at reducing that risk from DCD donors. And this is just, again, more evidence um, supporting hope uh, to, to kind of older papers um, and then some more recent papers. But again, the literature supporting hope for liver utilization and reducing EAD and reducing ischemic angiopathy just continues to build. 
This is an, a New England Journal paper showing that HOPE reduced the reperfusion syndrome, reduced ischemic angiopathy, and also reduced EAD somewhat as well, which was an important finding because we attribute that more to normal thermic preservation compared to hypothermic oxygenated perfusion. And this, this uh, study showed that less um, interventions on the bile duct were required if HOPE was used compared to static cold storage. Now, viability testing is something that makes a lot of sense in the normal thermic perfusion world because the liver is warm and oxygenated and thinks it's in the body. So you could see how you could test the perfusate and see how the liver is working. And people didn't think that was possible for hypothermic preservation until recently, but groups are working on figuring out how to do viability testing at lower temperatures. So doing viability testing during hypothermic preservation because we need to understand the viability, not just of the hepatocyte plates to reduce EAD, but we need to understand the viability of the cholangiocytes to reduce the risk of ischemic cholangiopathy. And there are groups that are saying that that is possible and producing data that shows that it is possible to do viability testing even at colder temperatures. And more recently, this um, molecule FMN that comes from mitochondria that are injured has been used as a marker in the perfusate during HOPE as a way to do viability testing. And that shows a lot of promise. So people are pretty excited about the option of viability testing during HOPE to see if the liver is going to have trouble with the bile ducts after transplant or not. But again, it's really hard to design a clinical trial where you almost crash an airplane. So we're at the infant stages of viability testing, both for normothermia and for hypothermia. But hopefully we will um, get closer and closer to really understanding viability tester, testing over the next few years. And this is the data that was just presented last week or two weeks ago at a big liver meeting about an update from the clinical trial that's going on in the United States. You can see it's a big clinical trial at a lot of medical centers comparing static cold storage to hypothermic oxygenated perfusion. And it's about half enrolled. The planned enrollment is about 250 patients and we're up to 100. And again, this is not a viability testing trial. This is an outcomes trial. Uh, using the VitaSmart device, the device which is back at the recipient hospital and um, has a simple perfusate filled with oxygen. The primary endpoint for this trial is EAD or early allograft dysfunction, which is great, which is a great endpoint that we're really excited to see if it will pass that endpoint. And we're also looking at hospital stay, um, early allograft dysfunction as quantified by the MEF score, which is a way to quantify early allograft dysfunction and other risks that we've talked about. I am not allowed to discuss the results of the trial, uh, but the results were presented a couple of weeks ago and we're halfway um, enrolled basically. And the EAD endpoint has already been reached. So it, uh, halfway through the trial, even with half the number of patients, we can see that EAD is already less in the uh, hypothermic arm compared to the static cold storage arm and length of stay is also less. So the final data will be published when the trial is done, but halfway through, we, even, we already have enough patients to show the primary endpoint is significantly different. So that's very exciting. So let's just talk about the three groups of preservation technologies and the pros and cons. So hypothermic, we talked about, is something that happens back to base or back at the recipient hospital. You perfuse the liver for 90 minutes right before you implant it. It's a simple perfusate with oxygen in it. The pros are that it happens back at the recipient hospital, so you don't have to send a team to the donor hospital and do anything different at the donor hospital. It's a simple setup. It doesn't take any surgical expertise. It's very, very simple. And you can initiate it late in the process. You just have to do it before you do the transplant. It doesn't, it's not something that has to be planned well in advance. And it's not resource intensive. And it's been used in a lot of European countries already for years. And there's a lot of experience already out there with it. The cons are that it's not FDA approved in the United States yet. So if you, uh, you want to use it, you have to be in a clinical trial. And our understanding of viability testing is at its early stages because it's hypothermic. 
but we know that it reduces EAD to some degree and definitely reduces ischemic angiopathy and increases liver utilization. So it increases the number of marginal livers that we're able to use to get more people transplanted. For normothermic machine perfusion, this is started at the donor hospital. You perfuse the liver for four to 24 hours after it's taken out of the donor, and you perfuse it with red blood cells and medications and oxygen. And you can check the lactate to see if the liver is working. The PROSAR allows viability testing pretty clearly, um, and it dramatically reduces the cold ischemia time, which is less stressful for the cells of the liver, and is now FDA approved in the United States. So this uh, can be done in the United States outside of clinical trials, which is a wonderful development that's very recent. And it makes surgeons extremely comfortable and because you know the liver's working and you can see it and you can see it reducing the lactate. So it increases utilization significantly. The surgeons are not uh, scared of having uh, bad complications from a liver that has a lot of risks. The cons are that the back to base strategy with normothermic doesn't work. So you have to bring the device and the team and the medications and the supplies to the donor hospital, which, which is logistically challenging. It has to be planned hours in advance because you need to arrange the van or the airplane to take the device to the donor hospital before the donor starts. And it does lengthen the, the time of the donor procurement. It requires a really knowledgeable uh, perfusionist there, as well as a surgeon who's able to do arterial reconstructions. And it requires monitoring of the liver until it gets uh, back to the recipient hospital for transplant. But it significantly reduces the risk of EAD because it gets those plates of hepatocytes up and working early on. And we think it probably reduces the risk of ischemic angiopathy to some degree. And it significantly increases utilization of marginal livers, so getting more livers transplanted. Normothermic regional perfusion was that process we said that takes place at the donor hospital where they put the donor on ECMO after, after the donor's heart and lungs stop. And then the organ is uh, procured normally and then stored in cold storage in the standard way and transported to the recipient hospital. The pros are that it turns a DCD donor into a DBD donor and changes the risk profile of the liver, making it less risky. And it doesn't require FDA approval. Uh, because it's not a device, it's more of a process. Um, so there's no FDA approval required. The cons are that it's complex. It takes an experienced cardiothoracic team and abdominal team at the donor hospital to start ECMO on the donor and get the cannulas in and, and get the uh, organs perfused while they're still in the donor. There is some risk of organ loss if the uh, cannulation is challenging or the organs are not perfused well during the NRP and uh, currently it's not um, something that's done in all the different regions of the country um, due to some of these challenges. But it does reduce the risk of EAD, gets the hepatocytes up and working. It does reduce the risk of ischemic angiopathy because it turns a DCD donor into a brain dead donor, basically. But it's never been shown to increase utilization yet. And that's the one of the one category that I have much less experience with compared to the two above it. So if we were to take a step back and resources were not constraining, then we would basically put many, many more livers on machine preservation devices, and we would optimize the donor gifts given by these donors with machine preservation, probably much more than we are currently. Unfortunately, we live in a world that is restrained by costs and other resources, and this is important to consider. I think that in the future, there will probably be a device that starts at hypothermic temperatures to warm up the, to, to recharge the bile duct cells that then uh, warms up to normal thermic temperatures and gets the plates of hepatocytes going. There's something about hypothermia that's really good for the bile duct. So I think there's going to be a device that starts cold and then warms up to normal thermic temperatures, and then we transport the liver at normal thermia. And there is a, a device that, that does this already, but again, we're, we're not close to FDA approval. So the question that everybody wants answered is, what are the selection criteria for machine preservation or when should we be using machine preservation, which donors, which recipients? And that's a really hard question to answer. And I think as we talk about this, first we should talk about symmetry. So 
our brains really appreciate symmetry. Uh, you can look at an image and using symmetry, our brain can put things together into something that we can understand. So uh, we really appreciate symmetry in everything that we think about. And when we're thinking about selection criteria, the dots in that painting or the data points we're looking at are data about defining the benefits. Uh, the we also need relatively uniform access to these different treatment options. We need uniform experience with the different treatment options. We need data establishing the safe limits or the boundaries when a uh, liver is too marginal for these treatment options, which we don't have yet. We need an understanding of the cost, cost benefit relationship, especially if these perfusion devices are expensive and require a lot of resources. And then we need cost parity so everyone's on the same playing field. And it would be really nice to have guidance from our international or national transplant societies. These things would help us generate selection criteria to understand which donors and which recipients would benefit from machine preservation. So let's briefly go through them. Device access is a huge issue. Um, there are so many things that go into which device you might have access to. A large one is uh, the regulatory environment that you live in in the United States. We have FDA approval for two normal thermic devices, but nothing else. Um, in England, it's different. In you know different parts of the world, these things are all different depending on the regulatory environment. Cost is different depending on where you live. The logistics of machine perfusion are very different depending on what part of the world you live in. Deceased donor organ and, and living donor organ availability is also very, very different depending on where you live. If you live in Seoul, in Korea, you have a much higher chance of getting a living donor liver transplant than you live than if you live in the United States. And that's just a product of society and the systems in place. So that's a great example of something that's similarly true with machine preservation. OPO practices in the United States have a lot to do with how machine preservation is being rolled out, and local expertise is also really, really important. So what do you have experience with? So these things are all really varied across the country and certainly across the globe, and we all have different access to devices because of it. And we have really no um, guidance from our international and national transplant societies. These papers are published saying that we should use machine perfusion, but they don't give us any concept of selection criteria or when to use machine perfusion. And we know that there's viability testing. We talked about this earlier, but we don't understand the limits of viability testing. So how can you develop selection criteria when you don't know the boundaries of the technology that you're trying to use? Um, and we need to learn more about what the boundaries are. And that's just very hard to do safely. We're in the beginning stages of learning what the boundaries are, but you can't push the limits too far when you're trying to almost crash the airplane. And then another challenge with selection criteria is that we need to really have a clear definition of the bad outcomes. And in liver transplant, unfortunately, we're, we're continuously revising our definition of these bad outcomes over time as we learn more and more. So the definition of EAD has evolved in the last 10 years, and now there's five or six different definitions of EAD. So it's really hard to compare different trials. Similarly, with renal function after transplant or AKI, there's about 36 de different definitions of how you would quantify renal function after transplant. And so the studies comparing two devices can have dramatically different endpoints because their definitions are different. And that makes defining selection criteria really challenging. Another wrinkle to throw into the mix is this concept of a device or, or two devices that preserve the liver first at hypothermia to gently um, restore the bile duct cells with energy and then transition to normothermia where you can wake up the plates of hepatocytes. And as I said, there are groups that are doing this. And again, that kind of adds a whole nother variable. So how we can think about selection criteria for machine preservation as a whole when all these processes are slightly different and have different risks, benefits, and costs. So it's another challenge to develop selection criteria with all these variables. So I was trying to figure out what people in the world are actually doing, because it's really hard to figure out from the literature. So a couple of months ago, I basically phoned some friends. So I asked people what they're doing and what they've done in the past. So uh, at UCSF, um, usually these kind of 
um, practices start with clinical trial participation. So um, I asked people what clinical trials they were in. And at UCSF, we had been part of those clinical trials. There's a, um, a group in Cleveland that has their own device that they developed. So they did a clinical trial with that device. In Birmingham, the people we talked about before used generally mostly the Organox device, and they had been part of these trials. And a group in Italy uses a different device that we haven't talked about called the liver assist device. So those are the trials that they were involved in in the past. And what are they doing currently? Well, at, at UCSF, we're doing transmetics, normothermic machine perfusion outside of clinical trials. We're still doing the clinical trial with this device, but for routine clinical use, we're just using normothermic machine perfusion, starting that at the donor hospital. In Cleveland, they have that institutionally developed device, which does hypothermia to normothermia, and they do that back to base. So they don't take the device to the donor hospital. In Birmingham, this big group, which has been leading the world, they use the Organox device, but they only use it in the back to base strategy. They only use it due to funding reasons. They only bring the liver back to the recipient hospital and then put it on the normothermic device. So the liver has to suffer through a period of cold storage on its way to normothermic perfusion. And in Italy, they're using this liver assist device, which does hypothermic to normothermic, and they're doing that back to base rather than at the donor hospital. So you can see four early adopters, big centers, all doing four completely different things with different devices. So how can we develop selection criteria if we're all doing different things with different devices our data is all going to be different and hard to develop a cold hard selection criteria we also have to understand the cost benefit of these things and um, there's really no literature yet about the uh, cost of normothermic preservation or hypothermic preservation or normothermic regional perfusion and it's just a little bit too early. We attempted to do it with some of the investigators at UCSF, but it was just too early to generate usable data. Uh, so uh, we know that our patients have speedier recoveries after using machine preservation, but it's just too early to perform an accurate cost analysis. We need more time. And the FDA label for these devices is complex and different, even though uh, a lot of people would argue that these two devices are very similar. The FDA label is different for the two devices, which is just adds to the confusion. And then these devices below are still not FDA approved, as we had said in the past. So hopefully we're getting there with uh, some of these devices and they'll be FDA approved soon, but they're not FDA approved yet. So back to symmetry and symmetrical balance. And what I would say is that um, we have a lot of data showing benefit from all these different technologies, but we don't have all of these other things that we would need to really develop selection criteria. So I think we're really in a period of asymmetric balance, right? We have an enormous mountain of literature showing benefit, but we don't have all the other things that we need to really decide when we should be using this device safely and how to push the limits. I think when I talked to those four different centers um, a few slides ago, there was a clear consensus that there's basically three groups of buckets or three buckets when you might consider using machine preservation. And so these are kind of the selection criteria basics that I think we start with and then we build from here but there's recipient related issues such as it being a, a really complex transplant where you know it's going to be a really hard transplant like a second transplant or someone with really really severe portal hypertension or a totally thrombosed portal vein or if you're going to do a heart liver transplant or a liver transplant combined with a cabbage or a liver lung transplant those recipients probably would benefit from machine preservation also, there's probably pure donor-related risk factors like a DCD donor or any DCD donor with significant uh, risks such as, such as age or uh, steatosis in the liver, fat in the liver, probably would benefit from machine preservation and older brain-dead donors, but we don't know at exactly which point age becomes enough of a risk factor to require machine preservation. And certainly livers with um, a lot of steatosis or a lot of fat in them, whether they come from brain dead donors or DCD donors, uh, benefit from machine preservation. 
And then logistics related would be the third category. So situations where you're expecting a lot of, of cold ischemia time or a lot of preservation time, the liver would probably benefit from uh, machine preservation. But again, firm selection criteria have not been developed. So in summary, the donor, the recipient, or the donor-recipient pair can bring the risk factor, which would benefit from machine preservation. If not limited by resources, then uh, many would argue that most donor-recipient pairs would benefit from machine preservation. We see speedier recoveries and lower rates of the complications which we have tolerated for years. NRP, NMP, and HOPE all reduce the risk of EAD, and this outcome is more significant than you see with perfusion devices used for other types of transplant. We won't get into that, but when you can make the liver wake up quickly, you have a huge, huge physiologic effect on the recipient, and you can really shorten the length of stay and make the recovery much, much more smooth. We can definitely increase the number of livers that we use that have fat in them. And even if it's a DCD donor, um, we can use livers with fat in them if you put it on a machine. And hope and NRP and probably NMP reduce ischemic cholangiopathy. Hope and, M and NMP reduce organ discard. That is certainly true because uh, if we can see the liver working, then we're much more likely to use it with confidence. And there's an extremely low risk of any organ loss while they're on these perfusion devices. And end ischemic NMP, um, or bringing the liver back to the recipient hospital and starting it on normal thermic preservation is uh, risky. So normal thermic devices, at least in this country, have to go to the donor hospital and hypothermic devices can be used back at the recipient hospital and are simple and effective. So NMP and NRP are considered more resource intensive and start at the donor hospital well. HOPE is considered less resource intensive and starts at the recipient hospital. But basically, we shouldn't be arguing which perfusion technique is the best. We should all be working towards policies and procedures and solutions that get our patients access to all of these technologies so we can use any of them or all of them as needed. And I think that's the best way to the best outcomes and the highest utilization of the livers that we have available. Thank you very much.